These are the most saddest One Piece backstories explained. And to start off, we have this girl who witnessed her own mother's murder. Nami was originally found as an orphan by Belmare, a former marine who took Nami and Nojiko to Kokoyasi village and raised them as her daughters. Their life was peaceful until the arrival of the Arlong Pirates, a group of fishmen known for their brutality. They took over Kokoyasi village and imposed a heavy tax on the villagers. Belmare, unable to pay the tax for all three of them, tried to save her daughters by claiming she was the only one living in her house. But when Arlong discovered Belmare had lied to protect Nami and Nojiko, Arlong killed her in front of Nami. And even worse, to protect her village, Nami joined Arlong's crew to earn 100 million berries to buy back her village, but he had no intention of honoring that deal. Nami spent the next eight years stealing and navigating for Arlong, enduring his cruelty, and even having to steal from her friends. But dang, One Piece has some sad moments. Just like how Usopp was treated terribly by his own village. See, Usopp's mother fell ill during his early childhood, and during her illness, Usopp started lying to her, telling her that pirates were coming to the village. He believed that these stories would keep her alive and waiting for his father Yasop's return, his mother eventually passed away. And the trauma of losing his mother deeply impacted Usopp, leading him to continue telling lies to the villagers just for attention. When Usopp became friends with Kaya, he told her stories to cheer her up, like his earlier attempts to comfort his mother. But when the Black Cat pirate Pirates plotted to attack the village and target Kaya's wealth, Usopp discovered the plan and tried to warn the villagers, but as you guessed it, no one believed him due to his reputation as a liar. And while that is a sad backstory, this next one will probably give you mixed feelings. Cause this kid's only brother killed him. See, Doflamingo and Rosinante were actually celestial dragons living in Marioa, but their father, Don Quixote Homing, decided to renounce his world noble status to live amongst the common people. However, they were met with intense hatred and violence from the common people, who resented the celestial dragons. This period was marked by trauma, suffering, and abuse, which deeply affected both Doflamingo and Rosinante. This made Doflamingo resent the common people and his father for leaving the world nobles, and eventually led to Doflamingo killing his father right in front of his brother, hoping that his death would grant them re-entry into the realm of the Celestial Dragons. However, the world nobles rejected them. He eventually started his own pirate crew where he became the kingpin of the underworld, known as Joker, and gained control of the Dressrosa kingdom. But unlike his brother, Rosinante was kind-hearted and despised the path Doflamingo had chosen. He secretly joined the Marines and worked as a double agent in Doflamingo's crew to stop his brother's malicious plan. But this would not turn out as planned. Dang, that was a deep backstory. But this show wouldn't be the same if this character's friend hadn't died. Zoro grew up in a dojo in Shimotsuki village where he trained to become a swordsman. He had a friendly rivalry with Kuina, who was the only one of the dojo who could consistently defeat Zoro despite his relentless efforts. Frustrated that he couldn't defeat Kuina, Zoro challenged her to a duel with real swords. However, he lost again. Kuina expressed her concerns about being a female swordsman swordsman in a male-dominated field. Zoro, in an attempt to cheer her up, promised that one of them would become the world's greatest swordsman. But tragically, Kuina died by down these stairs the very next day. This sudden loss devastated Zoro. He would then ask her father for her sword, the Wado Ichimonji, to fulfill their promise and vow to become the world's greatest swordsman in her honor carrying both their dreams. Man, hearing that, I could almost tear up. But this next backstory will definitely have you in tears. Because this reindeer went through torture just to save his father. Chopper was a regular reindeer, except that he had a blue nose, which made him very different. He one day accidentally ate the Hitohito no Mi that granted him the ability to transform into a human. He was then abandoned by his herd. And as Chopper wandered into a human village, he was shot by a villager, but was saved back to health by Dr. Hirolik a quack doctor with a heart of gold. Dr. Hirolik quickly became a father figure for Chopper, but Hirolik was terminally ill, a fact that he kept hidden from Chopper. Desperate to help, Chopper unknowingly gathered a poisonous mushroom believed to cure any illness. Dr. Hirolik, understanding the effort and love behind Chopper's act, consumed the mushroom to spare Chopper's feelings, leading him to his death. After his death, Chopper learned medicine and trained to be a doctor under Dr. Curia and vowed to carry on Dr. Hirolik's will and dream of curing all diseases. Someone's gotta be cutting onions in here, man. Kinda like how this kid's dad locked him in prison for cooking. 
Sanji was born as the third son of the Vin Smoke family, and he and his siblings were genetically modified before birth by their father, Judge Vin Smoke, to enhance their physical abilities and remove their emotions. However, Sanji was born without any enhancements and was deemed a failure. So he endured physical and emotional abuse from his siblings and his father, and his mother was the only one who really showed him any love or kindness. He would make her meals just to cheer her up as she got very sick, and soon afterwards she passed away. And Judge, disgusted by Sanji's weakness, imprisoned him and declared him dead to the world, forcing him to wear an iron mask and locking him away. During an attack, Sanji's sister, Reiju, helped him escape. He fled the Jerma kingdom, abandoning his royal title and lineage, and ended up as chore boy on a ship that was soon attacked by the Cook Pirates led by Red Leg Zeph but the ship ended up crashing into the sea. But before Sanji could drown, he was saved by Zeph. Zeph and Sanji were shipwrecked together on a rock, and Zeph had two bags with him, one small, one large. He ended up giving the small bag of food to Sanji so he could survive. But as it all turns out, he actually gave Sanji all the food that they had, and the large bag was just full of gold. In an act of self-sacrifice, Zeph ate his own leg to save Sanji from starvation. That is a tragically sad family. But not as sad as what happened to this father. Senior Pink is a member of the Don Quixote Pirates, but his life took a significant turn when he met Russian, a woman who despised pirates. Despite this, they fell in love, and Senior Pink managed to hide his true occupation from her. They eventually married and had a son named Gimlet, but tragedy struck when their infant son, Gimlet, died of a high fever. This event devastated both Senior Pink and Russian. She soon discovers Senior Pink Pink's true identity as a pirate, further adding to her emotional turmoil. Following this, they got into a heated argument, and during this confrontation, Russian was caught in a landslide caused by the rain, which resulted in her falling into a coma. Blaming himself for Russian's condition and longing for a connection to her again, Senior Pink started wearing baby clothes similar to those worn by their late son Gimlet. This unusual attire was a way for him to feel close to both his lost son and his wife, but she sadly passed away. But you won't believe how this next person was the only survivor of his crew. Brooke was the musician and swordsman for the Rumbar Pirates, and they sailed the Grand Line with the dream of circling the globe and making the world happy with their music. The crew had befriended a baby whale named Laboon. They promised Laboon that they would return to him after completing their journey around the world. So Laboon stayed at Reverse Mountain, waiting for their return. But their journey took a tragic turn when they entered the Florian Triangle, a dangerous and mysterious area of the Grand Line. They encountered enemies who used poison weapons, and the entire crew, including Brooke, was poisoned and faced certain death. Before dying, Brooke had eaten the Yomi Yomi no Mi, which allows its user to revive after death. And slowly, the crew dropped one by one, singing their very last song together. After the crew all passed away, Brooke was resurrected, but as a skeleton, because his soul had trouble finding his body in the foggy Florian Triangle. Brooke awoke to find himself alone on the ghost ship, with the lifeless bodies of his friends around him. Brooke spent decades alone, the only company being a tone dial that recorded the last song and messages of his deceased crewmates, which he promised to share with the Laboon. He was then found by the Straw Hats, finding a new crew to see Laboon again, and he hasn't gotten lost since. But dang, that's still very devastating. And this next story is going to hit you in your feels even more so. Jewelry Bonnie, captain of the Bonnie Pirates, was actually the former princess of the Sorbet Kingdom. Her father is Bartholomew Kuma, the former warlord who became the world government's first pacifista, and was later turned into a slave for the world nobles as punishment for helping the Straw Hats. Bonnie remembers how much her father loved her, and she hates the world government for forcing him to become a cyborg. She cannot stand the fact that her father is considered a tyrant because she knows that he was a great ruler, and her heart broke when she saw how he was treated in Mary Joa. Bonnie later discovered her father's memories on Egghead Island, and she learned that Kuma was not her real father. Kuma raised her and loved her like his own, and he agreed to become a cyborg to save her from the fatal Sapphire Scales disease. The Egghead Arc has shed light on Kuma's past, and it turns out that he was once a slave. His blood was tested as soon as he was born, and the world government was alerted that he was a buccaneer. 
Buccaneer. The Buccaneers are a special race of large humanoids and they're seemingly despised by the world nobles. Shortly after his birth, Kuma and his parents were taken and turned into slaves. His mother died sometime later because her body could no longer handle all of the abuse. Kuma's father taught him about Nika, the legendary warrior of liberation. One day, his father sang about Nika and a world noble killed him right in front of Kuma. When the world nobles held their native hunting competition on God Valley, Kuma was one of the slaves chosen for the hunt. And you think these backstories have been sad? Well, you can't count out Laws either. Law was born in Flevitz, known as the White Town, because of the white lead that covered the land and buildings. But this same substance was actually deadly, leading to the Amber Lead Syndrome, which the people of Flevitz, including Law's family, were unaware of. But when the truth about the disease was revealed, the world government and neighboring countries eventually decided to eradicate Flevins to prevent the spread of the disease, despite it not even being contagious. So Law, only 10 years old, witnessed the massacre of his entire family, including his little sister Lami, and all the other townspeople. This horrific experience filled him with immense trauma and hatred towards the entire world. After escaping the destruction of Flevins, Law was found by the Don Quixote pirates as a sickly child, both physically and mentally. Law joined the crew with the intention of dying. Law's life took a significant turn though when he met Corazon. Initially, Corazon was harsh to Law, but this was to hide his true intentions from Doflamingo. Corazon, a marine officer working undercover, grew to care deeply for Law. And as he learned about Law's desire for revenge and his terminal condition, Corazon took Law on a quest to find the Opi Opi no Mi, a devil fruit of the ability to perform miraculous medical operations. Law ate the fruit, gaining its powers and curing himself of the Amber Lead Syndrome. In a final act to save Law and keep him away from Doflamingo's influence, Corazon sacrificed himself. He ensured Law's escape and urged him to live a good life free of the hatred that has plagued him since childhood. Now, before we get into the last story, make sure you subscribe for more One Piece content. Nico Robin was born on Ohara, an island known for its enormous library and archaeologists. Her mother, Nico Olvia, was an archaeologist who left Robin at a young age to study the Poneglyphs. Robin was often shunned by the other children and was seen as a demon child due to her unusual abilities from the Hanahana no Mi, a devil fruit that allows her to sprout parts of her body anywhere. And one day, she met a giant Jaguar D. Sol, who she spent time with and became her only friend and even taught her how to laugh. But unfortunately, the world government viewed the research conducted in Ohio as a threat, as the Poneglyphs contained forbidden knowledge, including the lost history of the Void Century. When Robin was eight years old, the government sent a battle fleet to Ohara to execute a buster call in order to completely destroy an island deemed the threat. The scholars, including Robin's mother, who had just returned, were branded as criminals, and it turns out that Jaguar D. Saul was a marine and was actually escaping being caught because he helped Nico Olvia escape. And he did the same for Robin. But in the end, Jaguar, Olvia, and the island were all annihilated. Robin was the sole survivor from Ohara. However, with a high bounty placed on her head for her ability to read the Poneglyphs, she was relentlessly pursued by the world government. For the next 20 years, Robin lived a life on the run, unable to trust anyone. She joined various criminal organizations, but each time she was betrayed or forced to flee as the orgs were taken down by the government. But eventually, she finally found the people she could at last call friends. The Straw Hats. 